everybody. This is Jen from Garden Jen's Journey. Welcome to my kitchen. Today we're going to be doing some more preserving of herbs and I figured I would show you how I preserve my herbs um, in a different way. Today we're going to be talking about dehydration. I have a uh, six drawer dehydrator that I ordered from uh, Cabela's. You can get dehydrators just about anywhere that um, deals with food preservation. There's a couple key components you want to look for when purchasing a dehydrator. Um, many dehydrators that don't have a turn dial have for our thermostat are set around 160 degrees because they're sold for making jerkies and meats need to be dried at a higher temperature in order to be safe. For the type of uh, dehydrating that I'm doing with herbs and vegetables, you do not want a temperature that high. You're going to ruin your herbs and vegetables. You want to uh, dehydrate them at a temperature between 110 and 130 at the highest. I usually dehydrate all my things at 120 degrees. So you need to look for a dehydrator that has an adjustable temperature dial. Also, you want uh, a dehydrator that has a fan that blows um, sideways instead of up. Sideways is, is blowing the, the air across all the trays evenly, whereas when you have one that blows up from the bottom, the bottom trays are getting the most heat and things first and then the top tra trays are really not getting the proper airflow because they're all the way at the top and uh, the bottom trays get heated and cooked where the top trays don't really get preserved that well um, and that's why you have to rotate your trays the instructions will tell you on your stackable ones that you need to rotate them and that is why so you would really want to get one that blows from the side and not from the bottom. And so that's really important as well to have a fan that blows in that direction. It creates a more even temperature throughout the unit as well as keeping the unit, uh, the airflow even. So that's the biggest things you need to look for if you decide to purchase a dehydrator. Uh, that you want to use for vegetables and herbs and more delicate things besides just making jerky. It's the temperature dial and the direction that the fan blows. Today we're going to be talking about nettle and I'm going to show you what nettle looks like and then how I take care of it. So let's get going. Okay so this is a big basket of nettle. Uh, nettle or stingy nettle as this variety is known grows in wet areas it likes a wet environment so most of the time you will find nettle growing freely along riverbanks uh, lake edges where it's damp and marshy um, you will find this plant and you need to uh, be cautious when dealing with this plant as you can see I'm wearing gloves because it's called stingy nettle for a reason this plant, and I'm pretty sure the, the camera won't pick it up, but this plant along its stems and the leaf stems, it has little tiny hairs on it that uh, ha are coated with a chemical that the plant produces that gives you a stinging sensation. It causes a basically a chemical burn is what it's causing. And it's very painful. Um, sometimes even if it doesn't hurt you, 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 your skin's very irritated by it. And so this is not something you want to brush up against with bare skin. It's very uncomfortable and the reaction lasts a long time. Usually you can find an antidote um, for the stinging nettle uh, uh, nearby. Uh, I can't remember exactly which plant uh, it is, but uh, uh, the Lord's provided a way where where there's a poisonous plant or a plant that causes harm that's been planted um, naturally. Uh, somewhere in that same vicinity there's going to be a plant that produces the antitoxin that helps take care of what you bumped into. 
So you'll have to research that and, and look at what, what plant helps uh, in nature helps combat the stinging from the stinging nettle. But it's kind of neat. But uh, if you don't know that kind of information, you just definitely want to make sure that if you're in a marshy area, you're not wearing shorts or sandals or leaving your, your skin where it can be um, exposed to the brushing of the stinging nettle. Because again, very painful. It can almost ruin your outdoor experience. But that set aside, this plant is very beneficial. Um, it has a lot of good properties medicinally. You can also just add this uh, to your foods. Like if you're out somewhere, if you're lost, or if you're camping, you can actually eat this plant to, to nourish you. So um, you definitely want to look into uh, some herb books and some wild edibles. Do your research because you want to be able to properly identify the plant and how to use it safely. So I'll leave some links below in the description box to a couple different books I use. But definitely do your research before you just go picking plants and eating them. I don't want you getting sick. So one of the things you want to look for is to make sure you identify this plant correctly. Nettle looks a lot like, i got to try to do this without brushing myself, it has leaf structure a lot like a typical mint plant. So some people don't realize that this is a nettle because it looks a lot like a, uh, a mint plant, especially the younger ones. Let me see if I can get a... If you look at the smaller leaves of, of young nettle, it looks a lot like just uh, some, this uh, grows next to my lemon balm. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But the little leaves on here look a lot like my lemon balm leaves. You see the shape is quite similar. But the mint plant and the nettle plant grow completely differently. I don't know if you can see the difference there. So you want to be able to identify this, but like I said, one of the easiest things to see on a nettle, um, and, some, and you don't really want to get too up close and personal, but there is very tiny hairs along the stem and the leaf stem of nettles, and that's telltale to a nettle. Mints don't have the stinging sensation on them. So again, I use gloves. <clears throat> And uh, nettle, like I said, grows where it's wet. I grew uh, nettle myself medicinally, and I had it growing in a pot because this plant can be very invasive. It will take over if it's growing in the right conditions. So I had this growing in a pot about this size in my garden. I've had it growing for a couple of years because I do use it for medicinal purposes. And uh, like I said, it's a great plant. Um, you have to just get over the fact that it's protecting itself, but it is a very good plant. So I was growing this, and then I tried to make sure to prevent this from spreading, that I would harvest it before it started producing its seed heads. And uh, that went well for a couple of years. And then I noticed uh, this spring, where I've had my nettle pot sitting for uh, a couple of years, there was little baby sprouts everywhere. So unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you want to look at it, my nettle had gotten out of control. It had gone beyond the bounds of the pot I had it planted in, and now was everywhere in my medicinal bed. And so um, I was kind of distraught because, like I said, this can be very invasive. and. Uh, I was like, oh boy, what am I going to do? Because now I have nettle everywhere, and that can be kind of dangerous um, or discomforting, however you want to look at it, uh, because of the, the uh, stinging sensation there. So what I started doing is I just started um, thinning it out, basically like you do when you're planting your lettuces or radishes or carrots or whatever, and you have too many, you just start thinning them out. I knew that I wanted to keep my nettle because I use it, but I also had to keep it in check. And thankfully, even though nettle can be invasive, it's very easy to control if you take the time. And I'll show you. Nettle 
has a very small and shallow root system. And because it also grows in a wet environment, the ground is soft. This is very easy to pull out. So it's not growing a long tap root, not growing side runners or anything like some of the other invasive plants. It's a very shallow root system that's very easy to pull. So this is a very easy weed to weed out of your garden. So I was thankful for that. So, and uh, I would not recommend composting this because it might reroot itself in your compost. Um, if you have chickens, I would recommend giving this to your chickens because they will eat it and then, you know, they will compost it as they do their scratching and what chickens do. So yeah, I would not recommend composting this unless you run it through live co composters, AKA chickens. So, anyways, I just harvested it. Um, I said I was weeding basically my garden and just pulling it out. So um, that's how I was taking care of that and using gloves so I don't get uh, stung. What I'm going to do next with these guys is I'm going to get them prepared on my food dehydrator and get them drying. I'm going to show you how I do that. Okay, so I gotta move some things around. I got a very full kitchen. We're doing a lot of things today. Um, so yeah, my kitchen's kind of a mess because I have a lot going on. Like I said, I run my dehydrator right now about 24 seven because I'm constantly harvesting things from my garden that I need to preserve. I almost have to get two dehydrators, but right now we're just running the one. So what I pulled out of it today is something that I had dehydrating and I actually had this in there since uh, Wednesday because I was gone all day. And that's one of the things that you can do uh, when you're running your food dehydrator on a lower temperature. Um, you don't have to risk ruining your food because it's a low temperature. It's just going to keep things dry. So what I was drying in there was some kale. And this is actually a dinosaur kale that I got from Baker's Creek. And I just uh, put it on my trays and uh, put it in the dehydrator. Look at the ridges and the bumps on that. The dino kale is known for its texture. It's really cool. But um, yeah, so I just pulled these out and I'm going to get them in my jars. So I just take it and put it in the bowl. And then I just crush it. And then with the dino kale, you have the big stems. Then once they're dry, you just pick them out. I try to work smarter, not harder. Some people will take the time to rip the leaves off the stem and blah, blah, blah. I just wait till it's dry. Because it's just, it just, it's really easy just to lay the leaves on the dehydrator, let the dehydrator dry it, dry it out. And then um, when you crush them, you actually get um, most of the leaf in your mixture instead of trying to rip them off the stem sometimes more the leaves attached to the stem. So I just do it this way. And this works for with any stemmed plant for me. I, I just try to save myself a little bit of headache. I'm trying to take all the stems off first and then just do it this way because I can actually do this really quick.
And then the stems I just give back to the chickens or put in my compost pile. It's really not taking me that long at all to process this. Just a couple of seconds, actually. I think it takes me a whole five minutes to get this done. But if you don't have patience, you don't have patience. All right. And this is how I do my kale. Um, I crush it into small pieces and pour it into a jar. And then I can add this to uh, soups, smoothies, uh, veggie burgers. I can add it to a lot of things. I can make uh, lasagna with it um, as a, a spinach substitute. There's a lot you can do with kale. And when it's in its dried form, you can put it in things that you, you need to hide it in for other people to, to be able to eat it. And that's what's so great about this process is... Uh, my family likes kale, but they hate kale at the same time. So um, if I can crush it up and flip it into something where it's not overpowering, you don't have a texture issue, you don't feel like you're eating leaves, because uh, some people don't like the leaf taste. They don't like the very strong taste that kale can have, where it feels like you're eating tree leaves or something. Um, so this works for us. All right, I got most of the stems removed. There's a couple of them left. You see, that didn't take me long at all. So what I'm gonna do is get my jar. And I used, for our family, two quart mason jars, just because I dehydrate a lot. And then I just take, this is a uh, canning funnel. I just use that to try to make less of a mess. I just fill my jar. And this might be the last I can put in this one. I'll have to start a new jar. my kale and uh, I've been harvesting my kale all spring and that's how much I have in this jar and so that's how I do that and then get this out of the way I'll take my trays again and I kind of want to show you a a trick that I learned. Um, most dehydrator trays, they look like this. They have big openings in them and it's to allow for a lot of airflow. But when you're dehydrating um, herbs or leafy greens or small things, uh, they'll, they'll fall through these holes. So um, you can buy screens for them that are made for your smaller things. Um, but they can be kind of pricey. So I just went to my local uh, craft store and I purchased the plastic canvas. That's what this is. It's the plastic canvas material that maybe your grandma used to make uh, jewelry boxes and things out of. Some people still use this as a craft, but anyways, this is just plastic canvas. And I cut it to size. I only had to cut the one edge actually. And it fits perfectly in my tray and then it's so, the, the holes in it are so small that um, the small particles won't fall through this. So that's my tip for a dehydrator as well, plastic canvas. So I'm gonna put my gloves back on because we're again, we're dealing with stinging nettle. And I already bumped into it today, harvesting it, and my arm is just like yelling at me, but uh, it's okay. 
And like I said, I don't worry about removing stems and leaves and things from uh, smaller plants because the dehydrator will take care of them. All right. I will, however, remove the, the root system here. We don't need that. So I'm just going to lay it on here. And I've already made sure I didn't bring in any uh, bugs or critters with it. And then if it's too long, I just bend it in half. Because my trays, well, you could do this with a stackable one too, but uh, most plant material will dehydrate into very small pieces because your plants have a lot of water content. So you can stack them pretty high because they will still get quite a bit of airflow because this is all air pockets. Whereas if you were doing vegetables and stuff, vegetables are dense. So you can't pack them like this. Um, they won't won't work. But because I'm doing plants with a lot of air space, this works. And I've just learned this through trial and, and error. So that's pretty good. And then what I do, because this will get stuck in the dehydrator, is I stack them all at once to help push this down. I flatten it down like so. Work smarter, not harder. <clears throat> and I won't use that one because that's got a lot of dirt and stuff. too much about dirt being on this because the dirt itself as long as you don't get huge clumps in here the dirt actually falls through to the bottom and I just clean it out later yucky leaves like this leaves kind of nasty you just pick it off no big deal all right the other nettles I'm gonna have to rinse off real quick because they're covered in the dirt from being at the bottom of the bucket but I'm just gonna continue putting these on here and layering them in and I'm gonna slide this into my dehydrator and I'll show you what that looks like when I get this done. Okay, so this is the dehydrator, and it's kind of a mess right now. Like I said, I use this a lot, so I, huh, I think since I have some chamomile on here and some things like that, just haven't cleaned it off. But uh, I just wanted to show you what it looks like real quick. Again, I got this from Cabela's, and it has the temperature dial on it. So, like I said, I keep it between. Uh, 110 and 130. I usually keep it more towards 110 because you can dry it longer. You don't want to dry it hotter. Uh, if you're talking about meats and stuff though, you do need to go hotter. But herbs and things like that, you can dry longer at a cooler temperature and you'll achieve the same results. And it has the fan back here that blows this way across all the trays. So again, it's an even flow. So this is how I get my leafy greens in here and herbs that can kind of, you know, take up a lot of space. I stack them on top of each other first. That way the, the plant material presses itself down between the sandwiches and it slides in a lot better. 
you can see how this is piled quite high so what I do is I take just an empty one and I gotta put you down for a minute okay so I just set the empty one on top of the, the, the other one that I had so it sandwiches this down and it keeps the plant material from getting up and stuck into the thermostat which can cause your unit to, to overheat so this is how I do it and then I just slide them all in together I'll try to no. try not to get stung here and just tuck these in here there we go all right, so that's in there, and then I just turn it on. Okay, so that's how I dehydrate my nettle and other herbs. Um, and one of the things about nettle, um, just to clarify, because I think I forgot to notate it, is nettle, um, once it's cooked or dehydrated, loses its sting. Um, the chemical has been, uh, what's the word? It has been uh, taken care of, so to speak, so you don't have to worry about it um, once it's cooked or dehydrated. And then um, you just store it and use it as necessary. Um, you can use it, again, as food, or you can use it for medicinal purposes. I use nettle in a lot of teas. Um, I do make some infusions with it uh, for, like, uh, lip balms and things like that. Um, I won't go into detail because, again, I'm not a doctor and I can't promote um, these items to uh, help you healthfully um, myself. You have to do your own research and figure out if this is best for you and your family. So this is just how I use nettle. Again, you want to use caution when harvesting it. Harvest it early in the morning. Um, it's very easy to pull out if it's in a spot where you don't like it. Um, and just make sure to dry it or cook it fully and you don't have to worry about the stinging part anymore. So I hope you can see the benefits of uh, using nettle, even though it's considered a weed, um, and that you might want to add it to your diet if you find that it works for you. So this is Jen from Garden Jen's Journey. Have a wonderful day everybody. Bye!